Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And in this episode, we're talking about kind of a pair of weather phenomena. They go hand in hand, opposites of one another, but they're integral in terms of long range forecasting. We're going to break down El Nino and La Nina and how they influence the weather you feel during a particular season. So joining us to do that is senior meteorologist and lead U.S. AccuWeather long range forecaster, Paul Pastelak. Paul, hey. we always love talking to you. Good to see you, Jeff. Well, thanks for uh, making time for us here. Absolutely. Got yeah. a busy schedule, I know. Oh. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think back to Chris Farley and Saturday Night Live okay. with the uh, the El Nino character. Oh, remember yeah, that? I remember that. That Which, was one of my favorites. It was great. It yes. was great. Tassels, glitter, and uh, he was. Uh, he said that he was Spanish for the Nino. The Nino. We're going to talk about this. Uh, so, uh, in long-range forecasting, obviously, this is a critical thing that you look to. It is. It's one of the main drivers of our seasonal forecast that we do here. Uh, and it's kind of one of the first things that I look at. I look at a bunch of years, I put them down on paper, and one of the big things that comes out is El Nino or La Nino. Is that what we're looking at for the coming season? So definitely a, a heavily used driver in the meteorological world. And uh, a lot of the time, long-range forecasting, we're looking at things that change very slowly, and water temperatures, uh, big deviations compared to the norm, they're not going to change overnight. The thing about it is, is El Nino and, and La Nina, it's, it's about the water temperatures initially. But we all know that water temperatures ends up affecting the upper atmosphere and the patterns that set up not just here in North America, but globally. And so that's why it's such a big deal. It's one of the things that we emphasize along with ENSO. All of the oceans really are taking to place when we look at seasonal forecasting. So fundamentally, what is El Nino and what is La Nina? Uh, just, uh, just kind of a, yeah. a weather 101. Well, the simple starting definition of El Nino and La Nina. El Nino is this warming of the water temperatures anomalies that are in the central eastern equatorial Pacific. So near the equator, uh, from the Dateline to South America that we look at, and when those waters warm, we are in an El Nino when it gets by a certain criteria. Now, the opposite occurs on La Nina. The winds come out from east to west, and they end up blowing a lot of that warm water across the ocean, and the upwelling takes place, meaning the cooler water that's down below comes up to the surface, and the water's cool. So what happens is you get these, these water temperatures that are cooling off, and then eventually they end up affecting the upper levels of the atmosphere, placement of high pressure areas and low pressure areas, upward and downward motion. So you get all that involved. It all has to come in sync for this to actually have a big impact on our weather forecasting. And we ultimately do, if we have a big, strong ridge of high pressure west of the uh, west coast of the U.S., there will be downstream impacts. And uh, the atmosphere has these comfortable um, wavelengths yes. that uh, will affect things downstream across the whole globe in, in some form. It does. And, I mean, it, it affects the jet stream patterns, the storm tracks that we look at uh, specifically. Uh, during an El Nino, a lot of times here in North America, the southern branch of the storm track is much stronger than the northern branch. So what does that mean? Well, we get bigger systems affecting places like maybe Southern California in the wintertime, or we get the southeast getting hit pretty hard. Then you look at La Nina, the northern branch of the jet stream tends to be a lot more active. And so you end up getting more colder air systems coming down and more storms like clippers in the wintertime, those fast moving systems out of Western Canada that can bring quick hitters of snow. So you get different variations that take place, especially very highly correlated in the wintertime than the summertime. And one other note too, Jeff, is that when we talk about correlations, much stronger because the event takes near the equator, the, the closer you are to the equator, the higher probability that La Nina and El Nino will work to what it's supposed to do, as opposed to going toward the polar regions as well as you get away from the El Nino La Nina zone. So how long have we known about this and when mm. was this first discovered? Well, you can go all the way back to the 15, 1600s when uh, uh, ships were going back and forth in that eastern Pacific zone and noticing these big significant wind changes and the speed of their ships could be you know directed uh, at least the speed getting to destinations slower or faster depending if you're in an El Nino or La Nina but you got to really uh, you really start to take place when you go back to the 1800s uh, the Peruvians uh, they they're the ones that really kind of noticed it most for their fishery fishery industry because during La Nina what happens is 
the upwelling, the cooling effect that takes place brings a lot of the nutrients that the fish feed upon. And so if the nutrients can get up to the, to the surface during a cooler event, during La Nina, the fish are able to feed and they stay there and, they, and their industry blossoms that yeah. season. But if it's El Nino, Tennessee is the, water, the, the, the nutrients stay down below and the fish end up going somewhere else and they have a bad season. So they notice these cycles that take place. Fortunately, La Nina happens more than El Nino and that's a good thing because we have better seasons for fishery. That's very interesting. And that does align yeah. with what you were saying about uh, the closer you are to the equator, the more immediate and uh, higher confidence the correlation is going to be. Absolutely. And it's in their backyard there, and uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I never knew that about the uh, Peruvian fishing. But yeah. It makes sense. So obviously, with any uh, atmospheric oscillation or long-range pattern, mm -hmm. sometimes there are big, strong events. Then there are weaker events, and there's sometimes we even refer to La Nada, yes. uh, where we're just kind of in the neutral zone. Uh, so talk about how uh, the intensity of uh, the ENSO, uh, El Nino, Southern Oscillation conversation plays out. Well, over years, we've gotten more and more cases of what types of La Nina, whether they're weak, moderate, or strong. And a lot of times, there's been differences where it sets up. Where's the coolest waters? Where's the warmest waters? If they're closer to the date line, we call it a Central Pacific-based La Nina. And all these differences have had different outcomes on where the storm tracks can be. And a lot of it is related to what we call the walker circulation, the air going up and down globally uh, across. And if you have downward motion, generally you're going to have better weather. Okay? So if it's cooler water in the Central Pacific, the air is going down, but it's going up as you get over the land masses in North America and you have more activity. So it does depend on the, the strength. Uh, and also the timing when this comes on as well. The thing about it is, Jeff, um, the weaker the signal is, the less reliable we've noticed to, to kind of and go on in. So we've seen a couple of instances where we have a La Nina year coming up, and then all of a sudden, Southern California gets blasted with heavy rain when they're not supposed to get in in a La Nina. And if the La Nina comes in weak, there's other big drivers that take place. And so we have to keep, take that in consideration when we're forecasting the strength and the timing that it comes on during the season. Things uh, are never quite as straightforward as people would like when it comes to the atmosphere, whether it's a climate conversation, long-range forecasting, or, or anything like that. Uh, what are some of the main effects of El Nino in, in the U.S.? I know that uh, one thing that really put it in the media's eyes back in the 90s, yes. uh, excessive rain events, and, and the 80s too, uh, in Southern California during a strong El Nino, for example. Yes, they can cause massive flooding. Uh, you can see uh, heavy snow events, uh, prolonged snow events in El Nino, especially across the, the Sierras. Uh, definitely, uh, we've seen that significance happen uh, quite often. Uh, the thing about El Nino is, is that it, the, the, the patterns that set up in the Pacific, there's a split that goes on. And the, the storm track that goes pretty far south, even south of Hawaii, is what we call the subtropical jet stream. And when that's stronger, that feeds in over the Gulf of Mexico, which is generally warm most, most times of the year, and can really give a boost to East Coast storms. And that's why in El Nino winters, we always kind of look for the big bombers, right. the big storms, right? And so... That's what we kind of look for when we get El Ninos. We can see snow in big amounts on the East Coast, and generally that's what we kind of favor. The other problem, though, is the waters are warming so much that we don't have a lot of cold air around. It's tricky. People associate big snow with cold, but sometimes you have a milder than average winter, but you get that 25-inch event there for I-95, and it's just what everybody remembers. And, 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 you know, and again, if the waters are too warm off the East Coast, it could push the storm track farther in, and so your folks in New York City and Washington, D.C., they're looking for these big storms, but they end up being rain more than snow, and they yeah. kind of miss out. And so that's that's tendency that you see with El Nino. It's fascinating. This is what keeps us coming back for more year after year, though. There's <laughs> it, it, it a little bit of drama with the weather. Well, it is time for our first question, okay. uh, and uh, this is from Doug in Alabama, writing, what uh, is one of the worst examples of an El Nino or La Nina? Uh, was there a particular year or season that jumps out to you? You know, the 97-98 uh, uh, kind of was the changing of the uh, guard as far as weather goes. It really, uh, I think, promoted uh, a big change in the water temperatures. 
which ended up feeding into weather patterns that followed 97 to 98. Uh, we went out of a phase of cool waters in the Atlantic to warmer waters in the Atlantic. And so uh, I think the 97, 98 also we saw in the, in the uh, winter big storms on the West Coast and East Coast going on at the same time and caused tons of damage and, and much costly uh, systems yeah. during that time frame. And so that was a really bad El Nino year. But well, we have a lot more to talk about. We're going to continue our discussion here in just a few minutes. Uh, so coming up later, joint pain from the rain. It's a popular saying, but is this really a thing? We're going to look at that and other weather folklore coming up in our latest edition of WeatherWise. But next up, we're going to turn our attention to La Nina and show you how this weather pattern impacts the U.S. and the tropics and what makes it different from El Nino when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and senior meteorologist and lead U.S. AccuWeather long-range forecaster Paul Pasolak is back with us. Familiar face here on the AccuWeather Network. And, Paul, you know, we were talking about El Nino. And at one point, I just briefly mentioned, I said, ENSO, El Nino, Southern Oscillation. Uh, there's an opposite to El Nino, and, and this is not just the water that we're talking about. So what's ENSO all about? Well, you know, Jeff, there is... It went many years that people just thought there was El Nino and then nothing else. And so that's understandable. We just kind of stay with that topic. But it is related in the entire what we call ENSO, uh, you know, combination. And what the real easiest way to picture this is to think of blocks. If you have an El Nino, you have some very warm water. Warm air is going to rise from that warm water up into the atmosphere. The air is going to go up. But we know if air goes up, it's got to come down somewhere. And so think of it going up and doing these squares across the globe. Okay, so wherever the air is going up, generally you have showers and thunderstorms popping up and very active weather. Now, where the air is coming down, generally you have better weather. And so this is something that we found through ENSO, you know, by Gilbert Walker, the person that uh, did most of the research on this, discovered that. And eventually it led to something what we call La Nina. Okay. And that. So uh, obviously El Nino, you said that the, the, the Peruvians had an inkling yes. of this back in the 1800s. And the opposite of that uh, may have been uh, bad fishing, as, as you mentioned. <laughs> uh, when did we begin to kind of put a name on uh, La Nina, the yeah. opposite of El Nino? That's why they... It was bad when they noticed it, right? El Nino right. was bad for the Peruvians. Uh, La Nina was good, and that's when they, oh, they, didn't, they yeah. really didn't talk about it much when things were good. That doesn't but, make sense. Yeah. But when you go back to the 1960s, uh, Gilbert Walker had a friend. Uh, his name is Jacob, but I can't I have a hard time. I apologize. I have a hard time pronouncing his last name. But he worked close hand with Gilbert Walker, and they came up and looked back at some of the data from the past and discovered that La Nina was the opposite of El Nino, where you have these stronger trade winds allowing the water to, to cool because it's upwelling from below, and all the warm water ends up going across the Pacific onto the other side. And so you definitely get what you call a fast-moving storm track in the north out of this situation because of the patterns that develop. And also we've noticed, and this has been a general rule with tropical forecasting, that it lowers the frequency of vertical wind shear and you end up getting more tropical events to take place in the Atlantic Basin with the opposite happening because of the cooler waters in the eastern Pacific. Which is fascinating because it is five, six, seven thousand 7,000 miles away, uh, but uh, it makes a difference. It's influential. Water temperatures are so important. Yeah. I mean, they have such a big influence in La Nina and El Nino are the drivers. So what are the main effects of the La Nina weather pattern in the U.S.? We talk about yes. the tropics, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, the correlation with some more Atlantic tropical activity, but what else? Well, we talked about in the last segment about a stronger storm track in the south, right? The winds are blowing the, the warmer water away from the eastern Pacific towards the western Pacific. It allows the southern track to kind of weaken a little bit. So the northern track, it takes over. It becomes the bully. And uh, that ends up coming across western Canada, down into uh, the eastern U.S. But most of the moisture, a lot of times with La Nina, is dumped into the northwest and western Canada. And so... Most times and often, that's where you see the above average precipitation and the above snowfall is in the west. Southern California, you kind of miss out. The south, you kind of miss out as well. So that's generally as, as far as that goes. Uh, 
as far as cold goes, yes, you get a little bit more cold air masses that come down because our air masses are coming out of Canada. But a lot of other things depend on snowpack and things like that. And how about like uh, lake effect snow? Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely La Nina is the time to get uh, lake effect snow because that's when you can get the Arctic air masses in. El Nino, we have a hard time getting that kind of cold yeah. in frequently. And so you have less snowpack from and if, lake effect. If you're a fan of snow, uh, the, the Great Lakes yeah. are fun because you don't really need that uh, more warm uh, moisture coming up from the south. The lakes are there. They're going to provide the moisture. One more thing about La Nina is yeah. we've noticed after big events of La Nina that significant drought situation set up. And we saw that in California in the 2016-17 uh, time periods. And it uh, led to big fires that took place in there as well. So... Definitely drought is a major factor that follows a La Nina cold season and uh, can be can very significant and impactful to many things. Okay, we want to get to another viewer question. This one comes from Trent uh, in uh, to New Jersey, uh, okay. New York City, I should say. Uh, and Trent, what would you like to ask the experts? Why is one winter so different from another? Well, you can... I don't even think we have enough time for this one. <laughs> but, uh, you, you, you know, you look at the ENSO changes that take place. We've, we've gone over all of that. But water temperatures are so important. If the waters are warmer in the Northeast Pacific, it could have a different result of what storms and the tracks that go in there. Also, snowpack, the building snowpack in Canada, uh, if it builds faster, we get cold air faster, we get more cold air coming into the, North, into the United States. Uh, also, the water temperatures in the Atlantic setting the stage up to where the storm track's going to be. Is it going to be too far off the East Coast, or is it going to be right along the coast? Things like that have a, a, a very big influence on why the winters change from time to time. And you got to look at the stratosphere. Stratosphere can have a big impact. The polar vortex, we've talked about the polar vortex so often in the media. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could get moved. It could get pushed around. That could have a big impact on one winter to the next on how cold it can get. And then there are other uh, shorter scale oscillations that we don't have time to address. Yes. And this particularly the MJO and other things. So there's not just one driver most of the time. It's amazing how much stuff we have to look at before the season starts, I tell well, you. Well, yeah, you're a busy man <laughs> for that reason, and you do a great job. Senior meteorologist and lead long-range forecaster, Paul Pastelock. Paul, thanks so much. We appreciate uh, the fruits of your labor here at AccuWeather, uh, and you help all of our viewers understand this stuff better as well. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Good stuff. Well, coming up, can pets predict the weather? I don't know. Uh, Paul may have opinions on that, but <laughs> can you really smell rain? See if there's any truth to some of these statements that you often hear in our WeatherWise segment, Is This Really a Thing? When Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is now time for WeatherWise and our segment, Is This Really a Thing? Where we reveal if popular sayings about the weather are fact or fiction. So let's start with the premise, can pets predict the weather? Is this really a thing? Well, we know that dogs have a heightened sense of smell, and that may play a role in their ability to detect changes in barometric pressure before we can. Experts say cats are even more sensitive to sights and sounds than dogs, so a cat's inner ear will not only detect a drop in atmospheric pressure, but they also hear the distant rumble of thunder earlier than we can. So yes, it is really a thing that cats and dogs may sense a storm coming before we can. Next up, can you smell the rain? Is this really a thing? So that earthy smell that so many people describe as the rain is starting is called petrichor. These are oils and bacteria from plants. They get trapped in rocks and soil over time, and they're released by high humidity right before it rains or as the rain is beginning. So in this case, you're not specifically smelling the rain, but it is closely associated with the arrival of rain beginning. And finally, can weather cause joint pain? Is this really a thing? We use a barometric pressure to measure the weight of the atmosphere above us. And when the pressure is low, weather is often cloudy with rain, snow, and sometimes stormy. This can cause your body's joints to expand just a little bit, causing aches and pains. So yes, it is really a thing that bad weather can indeed cause joint pain. Thanks so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at AccuWeather.com. You can also call us at 888-566. 6606. Thanks for being with us. Have a great one.